sorry. Yeah, test, okay, thank you. So we talked a bit about uh, VPP this morning, but, but I realize uh, many people here may not know about, uh, about VPP. So let me calibrate my presentation. Who in the room knows about VPP? Okay, so some of you know, but not everybody. So I can, what I can do is uh, I can, um, I can uh, share a few slides about what VPP is. And then uh, while, uh, while uh, Jill Giles was uh, talking, uh, I did set up a quick uh, container demo using, uh, using VPP. So perhaps I will be, uh, um, it's very risky because I just did it now, so we'll see. And uh, <laughs> maybe we'll have uh, one of those uh, demo effects. And then I will uh, share with you slides explaining how VPP is integrated into OpenStack with this uh, networking VPP ML2 driver. Okay, so let me share a few slides first quickly, and then we'll go into the demo. Okay, so VPP stands for Vector Packet Processing. It's a project, it's an open source project under Linux Foundation, and it, actually, it's, it is actually under another umbrella project, which is FD.io, which stands for FastData.io. VPP is a software that does packet processing. What that means is that reads packets and forwards them and modifies them and forwards them again. So this kind of, uh, of thing, which is usually done in Linux kernel or in other packet forwarding or in hardware, right? So it's a software implementation. Usually it works on DPDK, but then you have other uh, I net packet IO that on, on top of which it can sit. And this project sits here in the, in, in the, in the stack. So uh, this morning, uh, Charles was talking about Open Daylight, which is here. I guess later in the, after, in, in the day, there will be a presentation about OPNFV. So a VPP is really low layer, right? The thing reading packet, forwarding packet. And that is the thing which needs to be really, really fast. So this uh, FIDO project is actually a multi-party project with many people coming from uh, many companies comp contributing. So we see people from uh, Intel, ARM, uh, Ericsson, so many, many companies are actually contributors. And it's a very active project, right? So here it's, uh, I, I, don't, I won't go into the details, but uh, basically I took uh, three projects in the same domain, so OVS, DPDK, and VPP, and tried to, to show the number of commits. So it's, it's, it's a very active project. Um, you have many components, but on that I will go quickly. So that's the thing I'd like, well, that I will go quickly. Why is VPP fast? And what is, what is that really? Okay. So what VPP does is it, uh, it reads packets and, and forwards them. So that does uh, layer two, layer three, and now we also have layer four. What is extremely important to understand is the, the secret sauce of VPP, and don't tell it because it's a secret sauce, uh, it's, um, it works with vectors of packets in order to uh, make the best use of instru in instruction cache as well as data cache, right? So what we do is when we have to process a packet, uh, we go through several nodes. So for instance, we can read packet from DPDK, and then we'll get a bunch of packets from DPDK. They will be processed at uh, Ethernet level, and then we perhaps will do IPv6 or IPv4, we do a lookup and then we'll forward it, right? So we have several steps, right? If you look at the usual uh, code data pass, uh, the, 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 the usual code for data pass, it's actually pretty long, right? So you have a lot of instructions to do because forwarding a packet is not that simple. You may have to do ACLs, you may have to do NAT, NAT or not, you may have to do many, many things, right? So it's a lot of lines of code. And what, uh, what we are trying to do is to make sure that when we execute an instruction to process a packet, this instruction is actually in the cache of the CPU. So how can we do that? Either we increase the instruction cache size, and I, I guess our friends from ARM, from Intel, they are all doing that. But what we can do as well is try to be smarter in writing our software. And instead of executing the full uh, data uh, processing, the full uh, code for every packet and coming back again, what we can do is have a small portions of code that are, and that are applied to a bunch of packets. 
So this bunch of packet is actually called a vector. And what we will do is we will execute a limited number of, of lines of code on this bunch of packet. So with that, we make sure that uh, the code is always, or 99% of the case, the code is in the cache, and then all the packets will uh, take benefit of that. Because the penalty to fetch the cache, uh, the code from central memory, is actually huge <laughs> when you are processing millions of packets per second. So that's really what VPP is about. So that's secret source number one. Secret source number two is, okay, let's assume we are good with our cache for the instruction. We, need, we now need to also to make sure that when we, have, we are fetching data to process the, uh, the, co, uh, the, the packets, uh, the data are here as well. So in order to do that, we, uh, we, we will process packets with uh, quad loops or dual loops, and I will show you how. So this is a very slow animated slide, so I hate that. So you have your vector of packets which arrives from your NIC card right, or any other thing. Could be through DPDK. If you have a VM that can come from a, a VHOST user interface, that can come from regular Linux kernel. And this vector of packet will arrive here. And basically, we'll process this vector of packet. And because we always have the, we, we always process a vector, so let's assume we are in this node called uh, IPv6 rewrite. When packet, uh, packet uh, zero is, is being processed, probably the code won't be in the cache because before that, CPU was executing IPv6 lookup and before that, it was executing IPv6 input. So probably when, when packet zero will be processed, uh, there is a very little probability to, to have this, uh, pa this, the code of IPv6 rewrite in the instruction cache. But, but now, the beauty of this model is that for packet one, two, and three, they will all have the benefit of the, car, of the cache warm-up, which was done for, uh, for packet zero. So that is really uh, uh, one thing which is fundamental f in VPP. So if, the, if processing this graph is slow, what that means is when we will then come back to the uh, AF packet input or to the DPDK input, we'll probably have a lot of packet waiting to be processed. So what we do in VPP is we tend to measure uh, what is the vector size. So if we have small vectors, that means that uh, VPP is doing nothing because, uh, it do, it, it, because uh, it's processing very small vectors. And when VPP is very, very active or when there is a lot, lot of packet to be processed, then we'll have, uh, we'll have long vectors. So, so the size of vectors is typically between 1 to 256. And um, if you have 256 vector size, that means that uh, your CPU is under high pressure. If, it's, uh, if you have small packets, it means that your CPU is, no, is doing nothing. So that is, uh, that is what we do for, uh, for, uh, to process uh, packets. Of course, uh, you may have vectors that do not go through the same, uh, through the same path in this graph, like here, you have an, a, a packet which is an R packet. Of course, this packet will, won't go here. So we are not saying that all packets have to go in the same path in this, uh, in this graph. Okay. One of the beauty of this model as well is um, these nodes are actually .so file, right? So it's really easy to extend. If one wants to add nodes to do some special processing, I don't know, that may be for, for ACLs, that can be for whatever you want, it's really easy to extend. You just have to write a node here. You do not modify the rest of the code. So you can localize, have your specific plugin that can be open source or even closed source. You do whatever you want with that. You, uh, you, have, uh, you have your plugins and you can extend this graph at runtime without having to recompile VPP. So that is something extremely powerful. And you can think about hardware acceleration. Like we see people having NIC cards, which are able, or accelerators, which are able to do crypto, for instance, uh, in that case, or, or that can do the first you know, levels of uh, processing in this graph. So, that, so of course, VOS user and AF packet input, these are software nodes, but nothing forb forbids you having uh, cards, which will do some level of processing and inject packet later in this, uh, pro in this processing graph in VPP. Okay. That I will skip. 
numbers. Uh, when I, when I say fast, what, what do I mean? So just few graphs, and, and I'm sorry, this is a, a bit uh, old uh, version, and we cannot read anything. Resolution is not good enough. Can you read something? No, it's, it's, uh, it's actually very hard. So trust me. <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> I, can we zoom in? <laughs> and I will show a, a, a live demo because slides are good, but demo are better. So after that, I prepare kind of a demo, a risky demo, but we'll see. Uh, what is important here is um, I did a test with IPv4 and test with IPv6. By the way, we have uh, with VPP, we have also a testing infrastructure, which is all public. You can, it's called CSIT. It's in the cloud. You can connect to it. It's under the Linux Foundation, and you can rerun re the test, read the measurements, all that is public. So uh, we is, what is interesting here is, uh, so we have IPv4 and we have IPv6. And what we did is uh, we increased number of calls, right, to do routing. What routing means? It, it means three operations, basically. One is receiving packet, two is taking a routing decision, and three is forwarding the packet, right? So uh, with Two calls, we do like uh, 12, uh, 40, 40, uh, 20, 24 million packets per second, whatever is packet size, right? So that is really good. And, and, and one of the beauty of this model is that when you are adding calls, you have a linear increase of the performance with the number of calls. That's extremely powerful because we did this test from 2 to, to 36 calls, and we see this linear increase thanks to this uh, cache effect that we are taking. So, so that is really good. This is with 1 million IPv4 entries. And we have exactly the same effect with IPv6, where we, have, we are increasing number of calls, and we have this same uh, linear increase, right? Uh, here it's 24 million packets per second on two calls, which means 12 million packets per second per cause. You seem a bit sleep, uh, 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 I mean, wake up. 12 million packets per second, right? Thank you, sir. Wow, that's what. Uh, <laughs> 12 million packets per second per core while wow, receiving, for <laughs> routing, and, and then forwarding. If you do the math, that's not a lot of cycles per packet, right? So that's what we do in this test. And then we did the same for. <coughs> it sounds like some people are still doing switching in this world. So you have uh, layer two processing here. And uh, with, uh, with uh, layer two processing, this is uh, uh, 20 million packets per second per core with the same linear increase, right? So that is pretty cool. And uh, now it's enough talking. And forgive me if that doesn't work because I just did this demo before. Here it is. So what I did here is uh, I, have, um, I have two containers with an IPv4 uh, address each. IPv4, sorry about that. And, um, and what I did is I, I put VPP to connect those two guys, and I will run an IPerf client and an IPerf server between these guys, right? So, and then please help me praying the, the, the gods of demo. Uh, we'll see whether that will work. So where, where I'm lost, okay, so IPerf. Two regular Linux containers running IPerf. It's, it's this, uh, this is not a bare metal server. This act actually, this is a VM, right? So I have two containers in a VM, okay, running in a VMware, if I remember correctly. And, uh, and these two containers can do with, uh, with a regular uh, TCP connection uh, with VPP in between, like uh, 30, 37 gigabit per 36, 37 gigabit per second. So that's cool. But I told you before, what is actually important is what is the vector size for that, right? So what is, let's have a look, uh, let's have a look at vector size. So, so we have a magic command for that. So vector size, so these are the nodes in the graph. So you, you remember the graph. In the graph, we have, the, we have all the, those nodes and vector size is, thank you, is uh, 6.93, uh, right, for this tab zero output. And, um, 
and uh, and for the tx as well. What that means is uh, what that means. The way you have to understand that is if we come back to this uh, presentation, which was here. When the vector when the vector of packet arrives, we typically process six packets here, right? That's the average we do. In order to process 40 gigabit per second in re in regular Linux kernel. Which is fun is that the bottleneck, so that, and so, so the but when, uh, when we are only processing six packets, that means VPP is not the bottleneck here. What that means is, let's have a look with the bottleneck then. So let me run again this hyperf. And so I don't know if you are familiar with HTOP, but the red is kernel processing. The green is VPP. VPP is in polling mode, so it takes 100% CPU when it has to work, right? So in red, this is the TCP stack. So the TCP stack is actually the bottleneck here. And if I stop my traffic, of course, now everything is at zero. VPP is, well, does have this so-called adaptive mode. When there is traffic pressure, it starts polling the packets, right? So it, it's an active loop. But when, it, uh, when, it, um, when there is no longer a lot of tra traffic pressure, then it stops doing that to avoid burning one core. So that is what is VPP. But this presentation was supposed to be about networking VPP. And I only have 10 minutes. So I will, what I will do now is I will switch to the other presentation explaining you how that, that can be integrated into OpenStack. Because all that is useless if that is not integrated somewhere. OK. OK. So networking VPP is an ML2 driver for OpenStack. It was primarily designed to support uh, NFV, right, at the beginning. What are the, the OpenStack features we support with VPP? VLAN, VXLAN, v VM connectivity is only with VOS2 the interface, otherwise that's, that's too slow. Uh, we support many security features, including sec regular OpenStack stuff, such as uh, security groups, but very advanced stuff, such as uh, JSON web token with certificates. I will show you what that means. And we do layer two and layer three with HA and all those uh, stuffs. So, Networking VPP has this architecture. It's etcd centric. What that means is when you want, when when Neutron have to create a port, instead of communicating directly with uh, with the compute nodes, what it does is it will put that in etcd, and then uh, the uh, the compute nodes will be wake up, will, will wake up and uh, will take into account that stuff. That is really cool because the problem with uh, OpenStack in such a distributed system is you don't know when a failure will arrive, but a failure will, will arrive at some point. And what we are doing here is we are making sure that when, uh, let's assume Neutron wants to create a port on this VM, okay, on this, uh, on this compute node. If this compute node is dead for some reason, or rebooting or whatever you want, when it will restart, it will actually fetch the states from etcd instead of reading that, them from, uh, from uh, Neutron. So it's kind of intent-based networking, if you will, because Neutron is writing its intent, the desired states, in, uh, in etcd, and then the compute nodes are actually reading these, those desired states. And if the agent, so let me show you what that means. So typically creating a port will go through these several steps. So first, there is Neutron asking to create a port. Then uh, this is stored in a CD. Later, that will be uh, understood by the agent. And then the agent will send the feedback and will notify Neutron so that the VM can be created. If for some reasons the agent crash, what it will do when it, when it will restart, it, it will do what we call state reconciliation. What that means is every object within VPP comes with a unique ID. And when we restart, this agent will actually fetch the state from, uh, from etcd, state, uh, fetch the state from, 
from VPP and will reconciliate the will we'll do a diff between those guys and 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 remove uh, states which are useless now and in include new states which are required. So that is uh, something interesting. Other interesting thing is, is it's very much HCD centric, which means that uh, if for some reasons HCD uh, uh, fails, uh, there is another one which can uh, end over. There are many, many uh, cool features with, uh, with uh, uh, networking VPP. One of them is uh, now we have this uh, redundancy between uh, uh, layer three routers uh, based on keep alive D. So, that, so if one dies, then the other one can end over. So that's uh, also extremely useful in production. Um, security. Security, we have uh, role-based access control. So when uh, only few compute no uh, the compute nodes come to his rights and they, you cannot write and read anything in etcd. So basically if uh, there is a malicious compute node for some reasons, then uh, you are sure that the database cannot be overwritten by someone who, who doesn't have the rights. So that is another cool feature. We have these JSON web tokens that can make sure that uh, the states which are written in the database have been written by the right compute node. So we have all that, right? So I will just go to the roadmap slide. We are now have a lot of, uh, of features. The next thing we need to work on is this uh, VLAN aware VM that we don't have and have a better R pending for, uh, for V6. So these are uh, really the remaining features we have now and you are more than welcome to contribute or to test it if you want. I realize I may no longer have time, so do, you, do we have time for questions or? Um, okay. Yep, five minutes uh, to, until the start of the next presentation. Before questions, I'd just like to, uh, for uh, those who aren't on the mailing list, we're having a, a gathering. There's some space in the Man Campus uh, Cafe uh, later this evening uh, from 7.30. So uh, you're all, well, um, some of you are welcome to join us. Come along. If there's room, there's room. And if there isn't room, then, uh, then it's, it's also the central, central, central part of town. So, um, so it's a big enough place. We should be able to fit a good number of us in. Um, with that, so any questions any about question VPP? About VPP or VPP used to connect containers or for OpenStack? I know it was a lot of things being showed in this uh, Presentation on there, is, there is another VPP presentation uh, later, which will go into more detail, I think, in the, in the yes. uh, higher level technical yes. details yes. of VPP. Um, anybody have any questions? Okay. Shout it out. Um, Jean, can you repeat yeah. the question for the... Does he? Uh, there is uh, so the question just, just for the recording yeah, the question okay, was okay. does the agent of VPP replace, replace the agent of neutron on the compute nodes I will answer <laughs> <laughs> so there is an I mean there is not an agent for uh, for a neutron in general people are you people may use will the agent which uh, which is on the compute node will depend on the virtual switch you will use right so if you are OVS you will get an, a neutron agent if you are using um, you know a br a regular li Linux bridge you will use another uh, agent so we have written an agent which is running on the compute node and that will drive VPP. So yes, the agent uh, on the compute node replaces this agent because this agent knows how to talk to VPP and knows how to talk to etcd. I actually have a question as well. Go. Is this different from the Honeycomb agent? It is, absolutely. Okay. Honeycomb is, uh, is a NetConfiang agent and here it's an etcd uh, thing, right? So it's, this one is written in Python. Um, you said VPP run mostly on top of DPDK. I know there is also an option to run on top of ODP. Please, can you explain the benefit? Uh, sure. So, um, in the past, uh, in the past, uh, VPP was uh, tightly coupled uh, with uh, DPDK. And uh, during the last version, what we did is uh, trying to have uh, uh, DPDK being uh, a plugin, an important plugin, but, but just a plugin beside others. So there are many reasons why not having, uh, not using DPDK. So for instance, in the demo I was showing before, I was connecting uh, regular containers, which doesn't work with DPDK. So uh, um, 
So on ODP, right now, uh, I don't know, to be honest with you, because I've, I have not done a lot of tests uh, test with it, but I know people who are using with it, are uh, working with it. So I guess there may be some uh, better performance with some NIC cards, but I'm not too sure about that, so I don't want to answer. So last question. Anybody else have a question? Um, I'll, I'll go beyond the usual suspects. Yeah. So the question was, can you use the VPP agent along with the uh, I think OpenStack, open OpenStack, uh, OpenStack enables this uh, option to have hierarchical drivers. So I, I don't see good reasons why that wouldn't work, but I don't really see the benefit of doing such a thing, right? So in theory, yes, but uh, why would you do that? I mean, if you use one for water, it's probably for a good reason. So I don't see why you, you, would, you would have those two guys was that, was that alongside, just to, for, again for the recording, the, the VPP agent alongside the OVS ML2 agent? Uh, okay. Well, or another custom agent. Yeah, you, you might, so you might uh, mix SRIOV and VPP that, perhaps. It looks to me a bit like a Frankenstein solution, but, uh, but, but why not? Why not? Okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, we're out of time. So thank, thank you very you. much, John. Thank you. So um, my next speakers, I will be meeting them for the first time on the stage. So, Jervais um, Martial. Uh